Hello and welcome to this session of Entrepreneurship Essentials. Entrepreneurship can best be learned from successful and failed entrepreneurial ventures. Today, we are going to talk about two great entrepreneurs who, who have made successful stories. One is our very own Dhirubhai Ambani, the other is Sophia Amaruso, about whom many of you may not be familiar with. They are successful entrepreneurs who started their life from very humble background and they enacted success stories of a different kind. We are going to see what. Their stories bust all myths around entrepreneurship. And I am sure their stories are going to be highly inspiring for all of us, for any aspiring entrepreneur in particular. Dhirubhai Ambani, an entrepreneur par excellence. He built Reliance Industries, India's only private sector for Fortune Global 500 companies, which are the largest global enterprises. 500 largest global enterprises and Reliance is the only private sector, one of them. He set up world class refinery. He set up best in class petrochemical plant using best technology in the world. That now contributes about 3% of India GDP, 5% of export and nearly 10% of indirect tax collection of government of India. In my previous lecture, I mentioned that as 5%, it should be between 5 and 10 in absence of any authentic, reliable information, source of information. Reliance Geo alone is going to contribute or going to add about 5.65% to per capita GDP as per a study done by one of the units of Hubbard Business School. He was born in a poor family in Gujarat. His father was a school teacher, but still the financial condition was not so good. Because of pecuniary problem, he started engaging in trading very early on at a tender age. He was selling potato fry and other things in a local marketplace. He was highly intelligent and had a high level of physical and mental energy, strong willpower just for life. He could undertake difficult activities and could complete them without looking back. He had high ambition to graduate and to start his own business after graduation. But the financial condition actually forced him to leave the country and go to Middle East. In fact, as per his father's advice, the, he started he went to Aden, which is part of present-day Yemen, and he started his career there as a petrol pump attendant. But he soon joined a company called Abyss and Co. Abyss and Co. It's a French company, and then gradually moved forward. Most importantly, he was a knowledge seeker, which is kind of unprecedented. I Means his his, hung, his uh, hung, hunger for knowledge was unprecedented. He self learned export import. When at Aden, while at Aden, he self learned export import, commodity trading, marketing and distribution, currency trading, money management. This happened when commodity trading in India was not prevalent, but he learned it hands on. He learned trading skill, made exclusive contacts in trading and export business. He had a high ambition moving forward, so he was just preparing the foundation. He extended free service to the Gujarat community at Aden, so as to learn accountancy, banking, insurance, shipping, shipping documentation. During lunch hour, he used to engage in commodity trading for hands-on training and during weekend he used to learn English. 
when shell refinery was set up at Aden, he was promoted to the manager of Avizan Co. As I said, he has a high vision, high ambition and a vision. With his ambition, he went to Aden, but in Aden, he created his own vision and that was to set up similar kind of refinery and distribution network back home in India. So with that vision, he came back to Bombay in 1958, but he did not have sufficient money. So he started making comprehensive plan as to how to achieve the vision. So he looked for, looked for a startup opportunity. He started Reliance Commercial as a spice trader in early 60s. His office comprised of just two chairs, one table, and he used to share a telephone with a neighboring office. Such was the starting of Reliance Commercial. While doing a market research, this is how, just look, how he was gradually planning and executing the plan to achieve his vision. So, he was always in the lookout for business opportunities that will give him higher return. So, while doing a market research, he realized that Indian exporters were mostly focused on high margin and not quality or a strict delivery schedule. That was kind of a short term focus on profit, not really on a long term sustainable business. So, he realized that this is an opportunity because people across the world would look for people whom they can trust, who will maintain quality, who will deliver in time, maintain commitment. So, he took that as an opportunity and he started offering quality goods and he delivered even before schedule. So, that is how he gradually gained their trust. He chose customers who value quality. He never used to trade with customers who, used to, who, used to, who would be happy for low quality goods at a low cost. Moving forward, he realized that spice trade has limited volume, limited margin. So, what he was looking for better opportunity. So, he diversified into eon trading, which was the mainstay for multinational such as Forbes. So, he made good money in trading business of eon, eon trading business, but here again, because he was focused on a long term vision, he was not focusing on making quick money or or, or taking all the profit home, he wanted to create reliable, trustable supplier base or vendors. So, he did not take all the profit back home. His slogan was, loss is mine, profit I share, meaning if I make profit, he, he used to make, share that profit with their suppliers and he used to absorb the losses. That is how the suppliers became loyal to Dhirubhai Ambani. He introduced a shiny variety of yarn known as Bambar and again he made quite good money. In the 60s, this is another story of his entrepreneurial vision. In the 60s, when the country was exhausted of his foreign exchange reserves, the government of India restricted import, only the essential commodities could be imported. So, most of the yarn or synthetic fiber import was shut down, was not allowed. So, many people went out of business and look how Dhirubhai actually identified an opportunity in this adversity. One of the main qualities of entrepreneur. So, what Dhirubhai did, he had established contact in Aden. So, he procured nylon yarn from local market and then he exported that to his contact in Aden 
he sold them at a loss, but in the process, he earned foreign exchange. Using that foreign exchange, he could import synthetic fiber to the country. And because there was very few other players, so it was, he was acting almost like a monopolist. Moving forward, he realized that young business has limited profit, limited prospect. So he wanted to do some value addition to the eon or value added business. This is something that we know that we call forward integration. Using the eon, he wanted to make fabric so that he add val adds value and then he gets better margin. So he put up a textile mill in Ahmedabad in a very small patch of land that has now grown to huge industry. He imported modern and best equipment for the textile plant that also shows his eye for quality and quality of the end product because modern machine only would be able to make best quality fabric. So quality had always been his main focus. The World Bank certified that the textile mill that is set up at Ahmedabad was excellent even by developed country standard. He also maintained good network with anybody and everybody that he came across. So back home when he started this textile business, he hired majority of his contacts in Aden. He bypassed resistance of the established mills. What is this resistance? As we, as we know and we will see moving forward that businessmen always try to create an entry barrier against new entrant. Particularly trading business has limited volume. So any new entrant is going to share part of the business and part of the, part of the wealth that they are about to create. So they, there were huge resistance from entry for entry of new entrant like Dhirubhai Ambani. So he could not actually enter into this trading part. What he did is he bypassed all these middlemen or wholesaler. He started selling his fabrics directly to the retailer. So that is how he could sustain this business otherwise it will be Im impossible. He introduced his own brand by the name Bimal which, which means pure. Moving forward he set up refineries that was his vision at the beginning and the refinery was such quality that the World Bank said this is one of the best refineries in the world. Reliance Industries and its many other subsidiaries now contributes to about 3 percent of India's GDP, 5 percent export, 10 percent of the country's indirect tax. I am repeating this slide so as to overemphasize this data. This is humongous by any standard. Imagine that we have 20 Reliance Industries today, our GDP will be almost double. A poll conducted by Times of India in 2000 voted Dhirubhai Ambani as the greatest creator of wealth in the century. So it clearly speaks volumes of art. Our next story is about Sophia Amoruso. She started a company called Mastigal. That company started from almost zero became a 240 million dollar enterprise very quickly even though she started from a very humble background. Let us see what. She is a migrant in US from diverse background Greek, Italian, Portuguese. She was diagnosed with depression and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in her adolescence. Her parent divorced and she moved and she dropped out of photography school at the early years. 
but importantly she had a test for vintage clothing and that actually helped her to make this entire story. At the age of 17, she left home. There was nobody to take care of her at home. Traveled to Sacramento, California. Did various odd jobs, including working in bookstore, record shops. She found herself dumpster diving and stealing. Dumpster diving is diving into garbage dumps and uh, salvaging some food extras that people might have dropped. So that was her condition. She was sustaining on garbage almost literally speaking. And she was caught stealing on several occasions. But she as I said she had an eye for vintage clothing. So she used to look around there is a chain of stores in US, particularly in US called Salvation Army. It is run by Christian missionary for particularly for less privileged people. So, they normally sell second hand clothing. So, he she found one jacket, old leather jacket and she bought it for 18 dollar. She posed herself in that jacket as a model. And uh, she created a page on my, my, my space. Those days my space was, was very popular, almost like Facebook. And she named her enterprise as Nasty Girl. Surprisingly, she could sell this jacket for $1,000. $18 was sold for $1,000. That is how an entrepreneur and a business were born. She continued this activity for a while and when people started buying and she started making money, at the age of 22, she set up a company called Nasty Girl. When the user base was crossing 60,000, she created her own brand of vintage clothing. By 2010, Amaruso was entertaining offers from a host of venture capitalists meaning venture capitalists were interested to fund her business, but she was turning them down because she was making quite a lot of money. However, during 2012, she accepted a deal of 50 million dollars for equity funding so as to take her business to the next level. In 2013, Amar Rousseau was 29 and in charge of a 240 million dollar business empire. In 2016, she was named one of the richest self-made women in the world by Forbes. Look at some of the metrics of a business. About a quarter of her customers visit the site at least once a day. Such was the attraction, such was the loyalty. They used to stay there for at least 7 minutes. The top 10 of these customers to visit more than 100 times a month. Many admit that they refresh the page in anticipation of new arrival. So, new arrival was a regular phenomena on her side. She sold 93 percent of the in inventory at mark price or full price when even today Discount is the order of the day for e-commerce companies. However, Sophia diversified or diverted her attention to too many other things and the business was neglected. Success actually distracted her into various other attractive things, things that are attractive in life. In November 2016, she had to file for bankruptcy protection. Am Amaruso resigned as executive chairman woman. In February 2016, Nasty Girl was sold just for a meager 20 million dollar, whereas VC themselves gave 50 million dollar and the valuation must have been more than 200, 200 million dollar 
at that time when they funded. Amar Yusuf, after selling the company, obviously majority of the money went to the VCs. After selling the company, she started all over again. So she founded Girl Boss Media in the same year. And her current net worth is around $10 million. A Netflix comedy series called Girl Boss, partially based on the story of nasty girl Ostelicast in 2017. She recently raised another VC funding of $3.1 million to fund his growth of, his, of her burgeoning media platform. Amar Rousseau has expressed the desire to be the next Oprah Winfrey for the millennials and beyond with a mission to help women succeed on their own terms. The term millennial may be new, so I'll just explain. Millennials are the people, are the young people who are entering into the job market in this 21st century. In her Girl Boss website, she mentions about, about us, our mission. We exist to redefine success for millennial women by providing the tools and connections they need to own their future. This is truly the mission that she set after exiting from Nasty Girl. Their purpose and their values. You can read them here. Five strategies were attributed to the success of Nasty Girl. Her understanding of the customer, an eye on profit, her social skill, consistent philosophy, uncompromising, uncompromised and consistent ethics. She knew her customer better than any other company knowing their customer. She could understand the changing test of the customers, meaning she could preempt what fashion, what shape fashion is going to take and she used to prepare herself with that. So people, her customer never used to leave her portal and go to some other place. She knew her customer so very well, it's a reputation. Her philosophy, she has an eye for profit. Her philosophy was sell at a price which is more than the buy, buying price, purchase price. So she always made profit from day one. She developed a pin sharp sense of who her customers were and what they are willing to pay for, willing to pay a premium for. So that's ensured that he make, she makes profit all the time. She made profit all the time. Nasty girl, particularly Sophia, was very active in the social media. In fact, her business started, took root from social media. So she regarded social media as her foundation and she always were leveraging on the social media. So she made sure the customers are served. Their ego is always titillated so that they feel enamored. And they used to post even customers picture in the portal and many other things so that customer feels a sense of belongingness to the company, almost like the company belongs to them. At the very least, they used to think that this is the company that understand them, that have, that has the best interest of the customer in their mind. Obviously, uncompromised and consistent ethics is the other one. Four reasons why it failed. It was very successful till they raised venture capital fund. But the moment money started, $50 million of cash was there. She started spending left and right. Cash is the king in entrepreneurship. And one should have strong, the greatest of respect for money, for cash. But she started splashing cash here and there. Particularly, she started diversifying into too many things, particularly her attention, not really the business per se. As success embraced Amaruso, she started growing a knack for everything, 
except the business itself. After raising venture capital, she moved the company into lavish Los Angeles headquarters, opened two brick and mortar stores that was never there earlier. She leased a dedicated distribution center, spent a fortune on marketing. So long, marketing used to be done by everybody. Everybody in the company used to feel a sense of ownership. They was, everybody was selling, kind of. This led to enormous leave in the burn rate and was unsustainable. Reason number two, of course, it, number one also subsumed in a way. Amoruso started loving everything other than the job. But as a CEO, one should love the job as CEO because the, the CEO job demands more than 100% of your attention. The moment you diversify into things like TV show, writing books, you can barely make time for your venture. The third reason that people attribute for the failure is that starting is easy, scaling is hard. This is a very important point. And many, many, many successful entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship ventures, they meet early success but they cannot, they falter at the time when they actually need to scale up. Here is what Mark Zuckerberg did. He hired Sheryl Sandberg very early as his chief operating officer in order to flawlessly scale the business. We must not be ignorant about our limitation. We should not think that because the idea was mine, so I can execute everything better than anybody else. That is a mistake many entrepreneurs make. So we must hire professional and empower them so that the business become, becomes autonomous. And we do what you are good at. We try to innovate new product, new services, new processes. We try to give direction to achieve our vision rather than targeting on small, small goals. Amaruso failed on this particular thing. She did not hire professional CEO or executives. She thought she can do it better than others. At the same time, she neglected. So the result is obvious. Reason number four, success is not a goal. It's a way of life in the long run. So when she was at the top of a 240 million venture. She thought everything has been done. Now, nothing more to be done. Now she could divert her attention for maybe self-actualization or something, so to speak. But the fact is that that was not success. Success was to run the business continuously as a successful venture and grow. Amaruzo did not have a long-term perspective. Here is some words of wisdom from her, from her LinkedIn site. So in conclusion, you see the background of these two entrepreneurs, you will know that anybody can dream to become an entrepreneur. One can choose to adopt the type of business based on the domain knowledge like uh, Dhirubhai, he gained the knowledge in petrol, petroleum, petrol and refinery and textile. So, he, he became successful there. Amar Rizzo had a knack for, for uh, vintage clothing and she was successful doing that. You need tenacity, understanding and readiness to assume the risk and have to be passionate about execution dream big, remain passionate and focus your energy to execute the dream, success is on your way. Thank you.